I will maybe just do a quick bio so everyone has a little bit more uh, knowledge of what you all uh, do, and then we can launch into our conversation. We're going to keep it very conversational tonight, no crazy hardball questions, but serious subjects. Um, Andrea Carnes is chief curator at the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth. Recently promoted from her position as senior curator, Carnes has been with the museum since the 1990s and has been instrumental in expanding the museum's collection and attendance and facilitating major exhibitions, including a 2016's cause survey that broke attendance records at the museum and an exhibition devoted to uh, Lori Simmons' first, it was her first museum survey. In addition, she's helped shape the museum's collection through the acquisition of works by Thornton Dial, Jack Goldstein, Eddie Martinez, Takashi Murakami, Wenge Shimutu, Shirin Nishat, among others. Her first exhibition as chief curator is what we're here to talk about today, Women Painting Women, that opened this past Sunday. Uh, Jenna Gribben, who I've had an immense pleasure to work with and write about, um, is an artist, a painter. Um, her sumptuous textural paintings hover between alluring intimacy and off-putting voyeurism. The Knoxville-born, Brooklyn-based artist paints her partner and close friends in intimate configurations, rethinking how fine art has long objectified women. Gribben received her MFA in studio art from Hunter College in New York and has exhibited in galleries in New York, London, Los Angeles, and Berlin. Um, Marilyn Minter, who I have had the pleasure of making a lot of trouble with during the Trump era, um, and <laughs> is a dear friend, um, is one of the most well-known and prolific feminist artists and activists of our time. For over three decades, Minter has, pushed, has produced lush paintings, photographs, and videos that examine our culture's emotions around the female body and beauty. A longtime and committed activist for women's rights, Minter has always made seductive visual and political statements and, in, and has supported organizations ra ranging from Planned Parenthood, we're all wearing buttons that Marilyn made, uh, and uh, they're bootleg ones, they're not official, right, Marilyn? <laughs> but they have nothing to do with Planned Parenthood. Okay, well. <laughs> they can't really. Okay, but. But these are for you guys, if you want. <laughs> um, and uh, so anyway, I think we should get down to it. Um, and I guess I just, I think, because most of us will have not seen your exhibition, um, I think that if we drew a Venn diagram, um, it is dealing with not only women painters, but the figure, which has its own fraught history, and, um, and certainly in the 20th century, um, less so today. And I wanted to ask you, Andrea, if you could just walk us through how you constructed the show. You, I know you have four different chapters that you have divided the works into. And just sort of speak to how did you decide, what was the catalyst for the show? You know, why did you decide to periodize it starting in 1960? So if you could just give us maybe a... a Good. Thank you, Allison, and thank you all for being here today. Um, I know it's, it's weird to talk about an exhibition that you haven't seen yet, but hopefully you'll get an idea of what it's like um, looking behind us. But um, the catalyst for the exhibition was really two things. It was like I had several ideas percolating, and we all went home for the pandemic. You know, we were all sort of the shutdown. And so... That, of course, had so many silver linings, like being able to think about what you really want to focus on. And what I wanted to focus on was the idea of women artists. And there were a couple of reasons. One was, I just, I can't even remember where I read it, but I read a blurb somewhere that Linda Nochlin's seminal article, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists, was turning 50 in 2021. So this was in like 20. 19 that I started working on this exhibition. So just thinking about like, wow, that essay is turning 50. Where are we now? Was really the reason why I started the exhibition where I did at the end of the 1960s, bringing it to the present to think about, at the time really to think about inclusiveness now compared to then you know, to think about how women have been left out of the Western canon of art history, but also to think about um, how now the definition of woman, you know, is being liberated from its binary terms. It's inclusive of 
femme identifying, you know, all, you know, all kinds of women now can make the range of women as subject matters and actually have some airplay for it versus the trailblazers. But I didn't want to make the exhibition, um, I didn't want to make it historical or chronological because there are too many holes in figure painting for women, you know, especially when performance and photography really reigned throughout the 70s and most of the 80s for women. So I wanted to, and I also thought it would be interesting for younger artists like Jenna to be in, in the same room with some of the trailblazers and to kind of like just create a thematic flow instead of a chronological flow. But there's a history there, of course, too, that's being told. So the, the four themes are um, color as portrait, First of all, the four themes, the four chapters are very fluid. Any artist in the exhibition could be in any of the chapters. Um, but um, the first one is color as portrait, which really has to do with using color to talk about um, not only race, gender, and sexuality, but also just psychological mood. Um, the, next, the next theme is selfhood, which is really about interiority. Um, but it can be very personal, or it can be also a kind of compilation or toying with the archetypal woman. Um, the next theme is nature personified, which really encompasses relating the female form to the land, to the landscape, or as like Mother Earth, the metaphor of woman as Earth. And um, then the, the fourth theme is the body. So, yeah. So, yeah. so that's a perfect segue, because I wanted to immediately get our artists into the conversation Absolutely. and it so happens that you're both chap chapterized or thematized under that theme of the body and I thought maybe you could both speak to the paintings that you you have in the show um, Jenna has a fantastic painting um, called the wrestlers is that the full title or weenie roast weenie wrestlers. roast wrestlers which is we got to get into uh, the weeds on that and um, <laughs> Marilyn's painting is called Red Flare. So I guess, too, I, I mean, I'm staring at Marilyn's shirt, and obviously it's not even the elephant in the room. It's the <laughs> glittery subject in the room. Um, not so glittery, but um, it, it, the question of the body, the question of autonomy, the question of uh, not just the right to choose, but also all of the precedents that this endangers in terms of privacy, in terms of autonomy, in terms of LGBTQ rights. So I guess I'd love to just toss this giant subject your way and ask both of you to maybe speak to this way your work has been taken up and the specific painting that's included in the show. I don't know who wants to go first. Well, I'll talk, just tell you briefly, I was, I think I started working with pubic hair before I started working with the whole body. I was just thinking about the fact that all through art history, you never see pubic hair anywhere. And uh, then when I started working with the actual female grooming, I thought, well, you know, all of art history, I could find a handful, like 10 artists that painted women, that painted women, women who painted women. And I thought, oh, well, well that's very interesting, you know, and is there a female gaze? And what does it look like? And will it change the meaning if I start working with bathers, which is, you know, Apollo. I always use Apollo surprising Daphne in the stream. There's all these allegories. Or they're, but they're, you know, they're softcore porn. I have no problem with softcore porn. But this is, you know, how w women are the object always. And I thought, well, what, does it change the meaning if it's the 21st century woman behind a shower? That's the only reason I used the shower, because I thought that looks like 21st century, and I want to make sure they have tattoos. And, but I, what I started with, the painting that's in here, is uh, the pre-Raphaelites. Uh, I was thinking about how they used these two different women who they actually pitted against one another. Lizzie <clears throat> Sadal. Yeah, Lizzie Sadal. And uh, and corn the other one was yeah, corn blue. Fanny yeah, corn, Fanny Corn. Fanny Corn Blue. Yeah. yeah. And how, you know, the same they they she took laudanum to stay white and thin and it's not that different. She died of a drug overdose at thirty and uh, it just occurred to me it's not that different than the body more 
uh, mortification we see right now with young girls and um, and how the contours and the eating disorders and and so I just thought, well, what would it look like? It, does it change anything if women pain other women grooming? And I've just been on that for a while now. That's my, my contribution to the show. <clears throat> um, yeah, a couple of things come to mind, actually, in relation to what you, you're talking about. So I, I like to play with tropes of, that come from the history of art also. And so this, you know, the wrestlers have been, you know, something that's recurred throughout art history, but it's always men. So it's like, oh, we should have these, these women. Were there a specific painting that you were thinking of? You know, Eakins, I, or? Yeah, I was looking at some Eakins for sure, but um, also just even thinking about like, like classical, um, you, it, it like goes, Roman. yeah, it goes back all the way. So it's something that's always been with us, this idea of the wrestlers. Um, and, yeah, in terms of painting women, first of all, I like to paint women um, that are both, like, the whole thing for me is, is painting women from the perspective, looking at, looking at women from the perspective of, of a person who is in the body of a woman who knows what it is to, to feel looked at. And to, to approach that experience with empathy, to be like, you know, to represent women in a way that is understanding of what it means to be looked at and what it feels like to be looked at and to kind of represent that experience, which is very different, I think, than the way that men approach painting women, obviously. So, um, yeah, so it's sort of like, and also, I think um, the weenie roast wrestlers is obviously meant to be humorous. I think that's like something else that that I try to like maintain in the work is a sense of humor. And but it is, it's. I guess it's just the painting is kind of like. Um, so the wrestlers, I, I, I'm talking in circles. But anyway, the wrestlers um, were. It, that painting comes from a series where I would sort of superimpose my friends wrestling on to um, a backdrop that was kind of made up um, from a memory um, from childhood or adolescence. So I was just sort of having like camping memories and then thinking of, it's a sort of reconciling the past with the present um, by having these wrestlers like wrestling around in my memory. And I think, um, yeah, that's that's sort of the where the wrestlers came from. But the idea of these women wrestling in this camping scene and their feet are kind of dangerously close to the glowing embers and the fire, and it's sort of like and they're literally hot dog like phallic the, little hot yes, dogs on the floor, phallic hot dogs scattered around in the dirt, which I love scattering phallic things in the dirt, you know, just like trampling them. But but it's a, obviously a dangerous enterprise. Like the, you're like their bare feet are gonna get burned, yeah. you know, trying to like trample these yes. these hot dogs. You know, it's like well, very. Well, I think it's, it's it, you use humor both of you. I mean, in different ways. But I think that um, there's another even more. Uh, tighter circle in our Venn diagram, which, which I think the show at large deals with, which is what happens to the, the convention of the muse when painted by women? Mm -hmm. And what is the, the female gaze? What is desire? What role does that have to play? And I guess, again, this is like a very broad subject, but because you spoke about Nochlin and bathers, you know, I mean, we're really um, here thanks to Linda Nochlin, and I think it's important to shout her out very, very loud. Um, and specifically, too, again, to go back to, because you had mentioned uh, photography and video and other media, I mean, there, Nochlin herself, when she did the exhibition, after she wrote the essay a few years later, she did this exhibition called Women Artists, 1550 to 1950. Um, but that show could have, really should have been called Women Painters. Yeah. Um, and she, that was really the genealogy that she was laying out because, you know, for better or worse, painting has a cultural primacy. So I guess I'd love to hear everyone kind of 
parse this question of the muse, its role in the history of painting, and this revolution that you're both bringing about by, you know, revising and, and, and radicalizing the question of the muse. Well, uh, th this is really interesting to me. If uh, uh, You know, we were just talking in the green room how much we are both f huge fans of Lee Miller and uh, how she was just forgotten in art history. And she was a muse of, because she was this beautiful woman. Uh, you read her bio? Oh, you haven't read it yet? I haven't read it. Well, she had syphilis by the time she was seven years old. It's a fascinating book. And she grew up in uh, Poughkeepsie, New York, and her father photographed her constantly naked and her friends. And how, but she was really sharp and smart, and how she became one of the first people that, uh, first photographers that were, uh, uh, that went to liberated Germany right after the war. The famous photo yeah, of her in Hitler's the bathtub. bathtub. Yeah, and, she, and there's, she gets no credit at all for doing any of these things. And um, that drove me crazy. You know, and I'm thinking this is like, like such a fascinating story. And then I started reading another book about what happens to muses. And they're all tragic endings. You know, these women that supposedly break everybody's heart, the femme fatales, the historical area where women have always been historically given uh, power. This is the one thing we've had. We've all known that we have that. And how, does, how do we work with that? in a healthy way. And um, this is like questions nobody's really answered. Yeah, I mean, um. I think um, the idea of, I mean, it, it makes sense that these women met tragic ends when they were, their role was it's a, sort of like, um, it was like these these vampires preying on they them. They aged yeah. out. They and aged they, out of being yeah, femme they, fatale. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I guess uh, that um, is one difference. Being being a muse to an artist who's also a woman is a much more sort of um, m maybe like maybe for the muse it's more of a generative experience than one where they're being you know drained of life. Like you know they're they're sort of. It, maybe the subject there's there's possibility for the for the the sort of energetic creative flow to be more reciprocal or I certainly find that in my work and also I happen to be the subject of my partner's work at the same time that she's the subject of my work so it it does there is a sort of circular flow of creative energy so I don't feel like either of us are going to meet tragic Ends, I, I have found that my, the muses in my world have had careers. Mm. I think that's the trick. Mm. You know, they have a real, one of them is a curator, one of them is a pop star, very popular. You know, this mm. is, uh, 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 they can't just be beauties. Yeah. <laughs> I would also just add to that that the reason I wanted to focus the exhibition on painting in particular is because it is traditionally a privileged medium for white men, you know, art historically speaking. And so to look at painting as a medium and women as makers who paint women as subjects to me just became very interesting. And the, I mean, with the exhibition as the curator, I'm not trying to answer the female gaze question necessarily or the, the artist muse question necessarily, but I want that to be something that hopefully visitors and people who, you know, think about the show in any way are thinking about, just that artist model dynamic, mm -hmm. whether you call it a muse or something else, is flipped. And there's a lot of taking back the power, I think, with a lot of the representations of women in this exhibition, like using softcore porn, you know, is something that women are objectified normally, or are objectified, but like putting it in a woman's hands but takes the power back. Right, and, and it's Agency. interesting that a lot of the women, like Joan Semmel, that you included in the show, um, I had done an exhibition a couple of years ago in Texas um, that was called Black Sheep Feminism, the Art of Sexual Politics. And a lot of those women artists who dared to go in that train, and Marilyn knows this very well, um, were sent objects of censorship, not by men necessarily, but by other women and by other feminism, feminists. 
So um, that monolith is something that your show, you know, implicitly unpacks. And I actually just noticed when I was looking at the checklist that there's, I think, one painting of men, which is the, sil would you speak about the Sylvia Sl Slay painting? Because again, it's like an interesting question about the model, the, the, sure. the, yeah. the, the art historical trope. Well, it's... That's not the only painting with penises in it, by the way, in the exhibition. But that one, the men are, you know, the men are in the role of the Turkish bather. Um, and Lawrence Alloway, Sylvia Slay's husband, the art critic, is actually the bather, the recumbent figure in the image. And I think there's a tongue-in-cheek there, but there's also a role reversal that Sylvia Slay is making very obvious. Um, but, uh, but like with Joan Simmel and Eunice Golden, who is in the exhibition, that idea of kind of... And this is more true of them than Sylvia Slay, maybe, but looking at sort of the heteronormative fe female to male eroticism and how there's never a market for that and how a, a male nude body in a painting is politicized in a completely different way than a woman's naked body. Um, so I wanted to include um, some images like the Slay just to see what it's like to, when the tables are turned and the person objectified as a man, and including women of color who use the black body or, you know, images of... The, the exhibition's multiracial in terms of the makers and the subjects. And again, like, just pointing to omissions throughout art history. I mean, it's an obvious thing, and, and you know, but in an exhibition that's a big survey like this, I think it's important to have the gamut can you um, tell us a little bit about the earliest work in the show? Because I, I know that it's given a chronology from 1960. I think Frida Kahlo is in the exhibition. No, no. no. Oh, it I starts with Alice Neal. Oh, really. Alice Neal yeah. is the earliest. So I just I wanted to hear, like, why did you uh, start there? Because, you know, there is a pre-war uh, surrealism, of course, would, is a very important subject for women artists and painters, so I was just, I'd love to hear you talk about those decisions. I, would, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I had everything in the exhibition at one point, but it, as a way of organizing it and putting a kind of cap on where it would start and where it would end, our mission at the modern is post-war to the present. So that just made sense, you know, to start post-war with, and because Alice Neal just so bravely did everything she did from the 1930s through, you know, 1980, um, I just thought she was a great starting point. And I actually thought Frida Kahlo would be in the catalog maybe, just as like a matriarch, or, you know, I would have loved to include Leonora Carrington and some of these women, but I, I didn't, I mean, it just didn't make sense for the museum and... I didn't realize that that yeah. was the specific yeah. mission of of the institution. Um, so I think, too, like, again, to go back to Nochlin, um, what's so interesting is that she not only taught us about why there were no so-called great women artists, but she also interrogated the genderedness of greatness. Mm -hmm. And exhibitions such as this, like I was, I w I've been like going down this Nochlin rabbit hole and also um, Griselda Pollock and all of these great foundational thinkers of feminist art history. And um, they, what's so interesting is that there, there's this kind of idea that in remaking the canon, what we're not, what we are trying to do, and I, sorry for the royal we, um, is not to replace the canon or to, 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 to promote greatness, but to differentiate the canon, which is really what Pollock said. We have to tolerate complexity. Yep. <clears throat> right. And, yeah, and I guess, like, I, I um, am, am interested in, in how do you feel that kind of more plural uh, approach to art history and to like a you know even the way you organize the show how does it play out like can you speak to some specific examples that you are really excited about that the show brings to life Juxt you know unfortunately we see the images but we don't see those conversations in the gallery and I'd love to hear how this remaking the canon is happening in the show itself 
Well, I, I do think it's a matter of inclusivity at this point. Like, I see the exhibition as, a, as such a positive thing. I hope that viewers see it that way as well. I had issue with myself and in even in, including the word woman in the title of the exhibition or, you know, just like I was immediately like, is that, is that problematic? Is that going to be a challenge? Should it, should it not be? Is this pigeonholing again or is it for, for further colonizing women? And I don't know how these guys feel about being in the show and other artists are here who are in the show. But um, I, I, you know, ultimately, things have changed so much since the time, even the short time in 2019 when I started organizing it to now with, of course, with what's going on with women's rights right now. And even, you know, everything that's going on with fem, fem, female identifying people has even changed in this short amount of time. So I think to take a look, just like take the temperature of what's actually happening with inclusiveness felt really important to me. But also, like you said, to kind of like, just, re just repoint to the idea that Nachlin talked about greatness and how and why that's a male thing. You know, why, why it's a privileged thing or why it was couched that way to us and how, we, we need to stop normalizing that because it's not true. And it is 50 years since she wrote the article. So um, I don't know. It just felt like a good time to open those questions back up and, you know, t I don't know, take a close look at not just why she wrote the article, but the fact that women have been doing what they've been doing regardless of whether they've had a, a market or not sometimes, you know, and just continuing that lineage. And... I think mixing generations is really interesting um, for all of the generations, even, you know. So for instance, like Jenna, who, who is Jenna's work hung next to? Who is, like, who are, who are, what are these conversations you've put together between generations? That... So Jenna's in a room with the Sylvia Slay painting and Micheline Thomas and um, Celeste Dupi Spencer and Apollonia Sokol, who is a young Parisian artist. I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with her work. Um, and uh, Lisa Bryce is in that room and Rita Ackerman. So it is a generational mix. And I think um, that, that that room is thematically about the body, but it's really about, it's really about performing gender and performing race and, and, and in all different kinds of ways. That's what that room really is about. Which I know, having not seen the show, I mean, I think you would get that more <laughs> if you were standing in the room. But. Certainly. Um, I mean, I guess, again, too, like, on one hand, it's very obvious that, I, I just keep staring at Marilyn Shirt, um, <laughs> that this subject of women painting women or, you know, female identifying artists depicting each other as a political act, but we have to also remember, again, thinking of Nochlin, of the women who objected to being put siloed in that way. And I, my question is to the artists, like, is this something that ever gets frustrating for you to be in these shows? Like, I, I recently had to write a big essay about this subject, so I want to hear you speak about, you know, the, the need, the ongoing need for this kind of approach, for this type of discourse. Um, how, how is the feminist kind of genre exhibition changed over your lifetime? Uh, I'd love to hear. I remember when Susan Rothenberg uh, said they included her in this giant, I guess it was a neo-expressionist, German neo-expressionist, she said, I'll, you know, I'll be in the show, but I'll never be the only woman again. And I thought, oh yeah, that's how you gotta deal with it. Yeah, you could be you know, the token. But you have to say, okay, but only if this person's in it or this person, and I like that. But uh, as as talking about uh, the idea that it was really difficult for for my generation specifically to accept uh, women um, working with sexual imagery, it was. I think it comes from fear. And um, I understand that. And the idea of agency just didn't even occur, you know. And I think uh, it's the ones that get most criticism, and this is something I would love to see somebody write about, that they're always young, young and beautiful, or young and, and attractive. Or if they're young and attractive, they'll get 
slut shamed everywhere by women and men today. And but if you're an old lady like me, you can do anything. So I mean, there's that very famous Maplethorpe picture of Louise Bourgeois holding that giant dildo, yeah. and everyone thinks she's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what Betty Tompkins and I talk about all the time. She was so censored, and she was such a pioneer. And uh, she was banned in countries. And, you know, her pieces were thrown out. I don't know about censorship exactly, but the idea of women owning, owning the agency of, uh, of uh, images for their own amusement and pleasure is so threatening when you're a young woman. And, and uh, why is that? When we did the sex work show, Marilyn was in an exhibition I did in London for Freeze that was called Sex Work. And it was when we were doing a group picture, I think, or we did a talk, and you said, you know, it's insane that it's not only because of the political change and, and time, but it really was about postmenopausal artists. Like, it could only be... Like we were with Cozy Fanny Tutti, who, you know, herself made art from her sex work, um, but, you know, we, everyone on the stage was of a certain age, and that was, like, something that really out, outraged um, the audience when you pointed this out. Yeah. Well, it's something I think needs to be examined. You know, and I, my whole... I think I, everything I do is, like, that knee-jerk reaction that I automatically have. That's the thing I want to examine, like we have such contempt for pornography. Well, that's it's a giant engine of the culture. And uh, we should be examining it as artists. And I think the same thing with glamour and uh, fashion. There's so much contempt for it. It's so shallow. It's so... And in Jenna's work, your work that is so, you know, like unabashed about your relationship, your, you know, your relationship with Mackenzie and this beautiful, you know, desire that literally vibrates from the pigment. And this is something that, you know, art historically speaking, you don't see it in the halls of the Louvre. You don't, I mean, you see Corbet, but it's, again, it's like bad pornography for, for straight men. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that my work is in really sticky territory and the way that it can sort of play into like the the desires of of the male gaze um, just as as a woman depicting sexual desire for a woman but um, I guess I just I reached a point where I decided that it was actually really important to include that like, aspect of my humanity in the work because otherwise um, well the work would be have this kind of like like placid neutrality that doesn't actually do the thing that I'm trying to do and also the um, people have a really hard time even with the work being as explicit as it is seeing that it's a romantic relationship between two women. I f have all the time people say, like thinking that they're self-portraits, like that the paintings of my partner are self-portraits, um, people thinking that we're friends. I had someone the other day like ask about like the sort of voyeuristic small little narrative tableaus um, where there's a lot of like peeking through doorways and they're intentionally have this like very voyeuristic perspective asked me if I know the people in the paintings. And I'm like, oh, there's literally one where, where my partner, Mackenzie, is checking me for ticks, like looking with a flashlight at my pubic hair. And I'm like, and in the, the perspective is like from my body. So you only see my pubic hair and then her, the top half of her face. And I'm like, you're really asking if I know the, the person in this painting? Like, it's really, it's really wild. People have a real blindness for um, romantic relationships between women, like they almost cannot see them. So I, they sort of have to be sexually explicit in order for people to understand that it's a romantic relationship. If that weren't there, they would really just refuse to see it completely, I think. It's just, yeah, like I don't necessarily. You're a pioneer. 
Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> it's like, it's not even like my great desire to make the most sexually explicit paintings, but it really does feel like if they weren't, if that, if that weren't part of the recipe, they would just get completely misconstrued as like... Well, I mean, I think when you and I had a conversation for your book, one of the things I really enjoyed hearing you speak about, I mean, first of all, your signature being these sort of fuchsia mm -hmm. nipples, which are an obvious signifier of something, and, but, but the hand, mm -hmm. like the way the erotics of the hand... Um, and th this subject, you know, obviously hands, uh, you know, there, you could do a whole show about the hand in art history, but, um, you know, uh, talk to us about the hand. Yeah, I mean, that's like, the hands are very important in the work, and I find them like, like, actually, you know, yeah, it's funny, the nipples, like, oh, is this like the titillating part of the painting? But for me, the, the real erotic power is often in, in the hands because, you know, as a woman who has sex with women, the, the hand is like the instrument, you know, largely. And it's like, and I, I think it's like, um, always sort of like I joke around with my partner and we're like in public or something I'm like put that thing away everyone can see you know <laughs> it's, it's not like, the hot dogs <laughs> we, yeah. we don't pay attention to the but hot but anyway dogs. so really... I love I lo that's like a very like subtly queer aspect of my paintings that I think like is lost on most people they don't really like the eroticism of the hand is not really doesn't really stick out to a lot of people whereas the nipple I think actually for me, it's about um, it's about giving that nipple feeling, you know, like the sensitivity of the nipple, and and standing in front of a painting and having an experience where you're having an an empathy with the body that's in front of you, and maybe there, you can make that connection by thinking about the sensitivity of the nipple. Maybe that puts you in the position of the subject. Um, but it also brings up the questions of cens censorship. So, and, and also I think it's funny because we're all trained to not look at the nipple. Like you're not supposed to look at someone's nipples. But then when you make it fluorescent pink, the person cannot not look at the nipples. So it makes people really uncomfortable. Like, God, I'm trying not to look at the nipples, but they're bright pink. And, you know, it's like anything to make the, the viewer like like awake again to the experience of looking at a body in paint because I think because because there have been centuries of it we're sort of we're, we're a little bit like like dead to the experience because it's so it's so known or we think it is so it's just a way of trying to make it a little bit less known or or sort of yeah jar the viewer back into a position of curiosity and experience and like a relationship a, maybe a bodily physical relationship to the the paint and the subject I also think that because painting for a long time lost its sort of primacy in our in our culture um, unless you're a trained art historian you don't know necessarily how to read a painting in the same way or, or you know understand allegory or formal things like the color, the, the way you are arguing about color in the show. Um, and that's, it, again, like just purely on, on the level of why do a show like this right now? I think it's contributing to, and I think in a weird way, Instagram has done a lot for painting, which is a bit ir ironic. I'm wondering, Andrea, how, like, because you curated the show during the pandemic, um, did you, use social media and things to see work or did you know how what role did this kind of interesting dance between uh, digital reproduction and the specificity of painting play in your process so that's that's a really good question because this this put me as a curator in a position that I've never been in before of course I I will say I I really wanted it to be only artists whose work I have seen in person before, even if I hadn't seen the specific painting in person, which I had with both of theirs. But um, just, I, I wouldn't take a gamble. I, you know, having not seen something or someone's work, I wouldn't be able to do that and feel 
okay with it. I wouldn't be able to sleep at night until <laughs> until the works arrived and, and became uncrated. And you know, but it was something that there there's a disconnect that happened in a way because of the pandemic, because I couldn't go to everyone's studio and like actually talk to everyone about whether or not they even wanted to be in the exhibition or not, which I did somewhat through sometimes galleries or, or the studio. I mean, for the most part, I wanted everyone who's in the show to want to be in the show um, in case it was going to be problematic to be in a show about women artists. Um, because I can see how, it, I mean, there's a definite argument that it is problematic, but I still think it felt like it was important when I started organizing it, really thinking about Nochlin and thinking about taking the temperature, but it, it feels important in a different way now that it's actually happening. So that's just, to me, reason enough to want to put all these women together. But I also definitely wanted to look at, like, not only inclusivity in terms of what it means to be a woman, but inclusivity in terms of, um, you know, women of color and how there's not just a, a female gaze, but it's usually an implicit white gaze, um, male or female, and an implicit white sitter and an implicit white viewer. And so just thinking about Bell Hooks, who also recently passed away, and, you know, like, wanting to be inclusive of, you know, opening up the conversation more today, of course... Emma Amos and Faith Ringgold and Alice Neal and again like some of the trailblazers in the exhibition were all fighting for their works to be seen and they were all usually you know having to go outside of the institution um, but there was a different issue for women of color it wasn't just the it wasn't the women's movement in the 1960s it was the civil rights movement and how to come together on all of that and be fighting for the same thing I think you know, there's a story there too, but I wasn't also just trying to tell an American feminist story, because, and that's why it's international in scope. But again, just to be inclusive of all those conversations, hopefully for viewers to come and think about when they see the exhibition. Well, I think that um, <clears throat> that's certainly the sea change that since Nachlin that we keep going back to, and her generation is this kind of intersectional feminism, which has been a big part of, um, I think, the current generation and younger, and certainly been part of the activist work that um, some of us have been involved in. Um, so I, it's definitely reflected, it seems, in the, in the show, which is great. Um, I guess I want to, before we like maybe open it up to questions, I'll just throw out one last um, homage to Linda Nochlin and ask everyone um, if the show were to stretch all the way back to the first known uh, women painters, who would be your pick to be in the show or what particular painting is important to, to you? Um, Oh, Susan, Val Susan Valadon? Yeah. <clears throat> Tell us, for, for people who might not know Valadon's work. She was uh, uh, an, ex uh, an expressionist. Uh, I think she was, I don't know if she was married to a, does anyone, you're an art historian. Was she married to a famous artist or? She was considered. She was married to a famous artist, but I can't. Yeah, I can't think of his name. <laughs> <laughs> or she was the sister. I think most of these, uh, the women that were married to the Impressionists were were family. Yeah, there were sisters married. Yeah, and it was, anyway, her, her work was, she's one of the few f female artists I could find that painted women. Mm -hmm. So I thought she'd be interesting. Yeah. So there's only a handful. Yeah. <clears throat> um... I don't know, I might say Florine Stettheimer. Um, I think that, uh, well, I think she's so completely brilliant and I love her paintings and her, her relationship to paint is so singular and fascinating. And I think that she is someone who was, um, like, like I would have almost said Mary Cassatt, which we've talked a lot about Mary Cassatt, and there's a real relationship to my work in terms, and like I really admire the beautiful intimacy in her paintings, and she's such an amazing painter. But she sort of painted like 
the boys in a way. You know, she fit in. Right. She fit in with what the boys were doing. Whereas, like, Florian Stettheimer, I feel like people were like, oh, God, we, I, we can't touch this flowery shit with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> like, it was so, in a way, feminine. You know, it was so flowery and, like, icing and all, you know, it was just, like, everything. It, it exuded femininity in this way that I think it's, like, Com made it completely impossible to, for it to be accepted at the time, which, you know, she was lucky enough to not need for it to be. She was able to still make her work yeah. without, you know, but I, yeah, I, don't, I think she's such an interesting artist and it, I would uh, like to see her included in a show like this. It would, I mean, it'd be amazing if we had images to show of all of these women we're talking about. But mm -hmm. I guess I would say Artemisia Gentileschi. I mean, I would take it back there and thinking about Judith and Holofernes as subject matter and just like this woman decapitating a man. I mean, it's pretty intense, you know. <laughs> so I think um, that, that could be, I mean, you know, that could be an interesting beginning for sure. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm personally obsessed at the moment with uh, this nun, uh, Plotila Nelly. Do you know? She was from the 1500s, and i interested in her particularly because while there were professionalized women artists around the time of Artemisia, she was um, kind of fell outside of that Nocklin example of, like, I'm a daughter of a painter or I come from an artisan's family. And um, she made incredible portraits of religious women, but she also painted like a 10-foot Last Supper painting that hasn't been on view until very recently for centuries. It's now in Florence in 2019, since 2019, so I think that's it. But anyway, um, are there any questions in the audience? Would anyone like to ask or, yes? Um, just considering the gallery, uh, do you guys have any sort of like other, I guess, races other than black and white. Um, because I feel like at least from the photos that I see, I don't know many of the artists, but I would like to know if there's like Hispanic artists or Indian or Asian, you know, American. Yes, all those things, <laughs> all those, all those people. Um, um, an Indian artist is in the exhibition. An artist from Colombia, artist from Venezuela. Um, I'm thinking. I just have to scan, scan the countries. Um, but yes, there are, are women of many colors in the exhibition for sure. Um, it, it's not just black and white, but there's also that, of course. Carrie. So here's, a, here's the sad, weird thing for me. Because it was a pandemic exhibition, it didn't feel right to try to shop the show when it would have been appropriate to do so because museums were furloughing, they were cutting budgets, they were closing their doors, they weren't, a lot of museums weren't even taking traveling exhibitions. It just seemed like an insensitive time to ask. And now I'm just like terribly sad about that. I would do anything, you know, maybe somebody will have a show that accidentally falls off their schedule <laughs> and they'll want to take it. But, you know, museums do everything so far in advance. So yeah, that was, that was unfortunate. But please all come to Fort Worth, Texas <laughs> to see the exhibition. Hey, I have a question about a female artist that you never really hear anything about. Uh, and it just always makes me wonder uh, why. Uh, Georgia O'Keeffe. That's it. I hear about her. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I hear about her, too. Really? There was a huge show um, in Paris but, uh, like a year ago, um, I think. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I don't know. I, it's a good question. I, mean, it's, I know having tried to find an O'Keeffe to borrow, it's very challenging. Um, so that might be part of the issue. But um, And her relation, I mean, again, talking about uh, the male-female artist couple, um, muse, uh, participatory muses, you know, it's a very, she is a really interesting, um, yeah, started with that and then uh, yeah started certainly. Also, um, you know, we're probably all insiders here, and so we have a lot of this kind of theoretical 
background and we can come to it with uh, <coughs> some of the assumptions that you're making out in the show. So I'm curious with your general audience who came to the opening and how much you've heard afterwards, is there a difference to, for um, viewers to see works made by women? It's so early to tell because we really only had the dinner for artists and lenders and then, you know, a, an opening for our members um, so far. I mean, it just opened to the public on Sunday and today's Monday, so we're closed today. So yesterday. <laughs> and I was flying here. But, um, but, but what I hope about the exhibition is that, I mean, honestly, like, another thought I had in the beginning was, wouldn't that be cool if, like, young artists, young women artists come to the show and like find their mentors on the walls kind of thing. Because I think that's so important. Um, it's so important to have those role models. And that's why I wanted the exhibition to be multi-generational so that young girls and men, you know, all people who are artists and want to find the courage to keep doing what they're doing or find something they can completely relate to would have the gamut of, of, of ages, and not, not even about age, but just like age in career, like young in career perhaps, or older in career, um, to just like be able to relate. And that's, that's been something curatorially that I've always wanted for, that's the motivation behind almost every exhibition I've ever done, is just to like bring new audiences in and hope that they can relate on, on some level, maybe that they didn't before. So I don't know what the reaction is gonna be. I know that the exhibition will be problematic for people, for some people in, in conservative Fort Worth, Texas. Um, and I'm totally down for that, like 100% fine, <laughs> fine with me. But, um, but hopefully there'll be some revelations. That, that's my hope, my greatest hope. Off of that, Deborah Roberts, I think, really speaks to what you were just describing. Her work primarily is for, like, especially in, out of an Austin. Yeah, she's an Austin-based artist. And she takes African-American artists from the Austin community who's never even been to a museum. You see these girls from her paintings, and they come and see themselves in the paintings and yeah. in the museums. Um, what scene was she part of, Deborah Roberts? Um, she's part of the... Thematically, she's part of selfhood, which is either about very personal moments or about compilations of women or girls. In her case, you know, these, these, these are collaged parts from different girls that make up two whole girls. So um, I wanted to include some young children, you know, women, young women in the exhibition. So, um, and I wanted to include, of course, Deborah Roberts. Um, but that's where she is within the exhibition. And I think she's in a room with, um, that makes, to me, perfect sense in so many ways in terms of how we all think about the dynamics of our gender, basically. And also in her, I mean, because her work is a lot about what you're born into based on color and based on position in life. And, you know, so she there's a lot represented by Deborah Roberts in the exhibition. Um, I want to go back to just a question, a questionable, um, in terms of what is the programming that the museum has around the exhibition in terms of engaging with dialogue that is uncomfortable, but also furthering and also inclusive? So we will have, a, the, the, the exhibition is open until September 25th, and over the summer we will have groups of young people who attend art camp at the museum, and those are all artist-led. So there will be lots of conversation about gender, sexuality, race, generations, all of those things, all summer long, mostly with young people. Um, young meaning elementary age through high school. And then we also have regular tours for adults who, you know, free tours for adults who come in through the summer. But in the fall, early in September, we just kind of have to go bam, bam, bam and have a bunch of talks and programs um, that will address all of the issues that the show addresses. And, but they'll just happen in the fall because we kind of run on an academic year for the most part. But they'll also... Um, there, there will be book clubs through the summer and there will be 
there'll be a film series also, and all of these things that will deal with subjects that are hard for some viewers. We'll do we'll do everything we can, just like we always <laughs> always try to do, um, to 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 help people understand what's going on in the galleries. Um, I have a question about something earlier that Marilyn said. Uh, she was mentioning about aging out of the femme um, figure, and yeah, that's so. Like when you look back. Like art historically, that's always the figure that's you know memorialized or you know slim, usually white. Um, and just looking at the images here, it's you know it's striking about you know their representations of bodies that are outside of that idea. Like they're older, they're pregnant, they're not white. Um, and I was wondering if you could just touch on the importance on what bodies are allowed to be shown are given work about our memorialized in the art and kind of what work you think still needs to be done on, on that subject. For, for me, Tessa, or for Marilyn? I You know, I think that's a really good question that has not been answered. I don't have an answer for it. <laughs> I feel like that's, I keep coming back to inclusivity, like trying to just make sure that um, there's a recognition that things, the needle has moved. I know it doesn't maybe feel like it right now with everything that's going on politically, but the way women have represented women, the needle's definitely moved since Nachlin wrote the article. So, you know, that's something that I hope the exhibition shows. Um, I mean, I only just think that um, it's something that's been so wildly problematic in the past. And now it's like, it's changing very quickly for the better and everything, we're all benefiting from the inclusion of so many more voices and, and the the art world, what we call the art world, has become so much more interesting just very recently. Um, and obviously there are tons of factors in, involved, but I think part of it is like the democratizing effect of something like social media, where it's like... That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Oh, social media. Yeah, and it's... And for all the evils of... Instagram, which we could talk about all night, <laughs> everything we hate about it, it has had that incredible effect and it's only just getting better and, and institutions, at, um, museums, but also commercial galleries are finally like getting off their asses and going out into the world to try to like, um, yeah, diversify their programs and and everyone is realizing that it's so boring to just have straight white people as your whole program, which is like what it has been literally mo and and almost entire and almost <laughs> entirely men. It's crazy. It's like I think up until five years ago, it was still like yeah. like ninety percent of. Chelsea gallery shows or men or so, some like obscene, you know, and and yeah, probably similarly white and similarly straight. I, um, but it's getting it's getting much better. I also um, think like art historically speaking that the toolbox that all these changes have uh, engendered has allowed us to go back to the canon and interrogate, um, you know. The, these representations that are canonical. Um, there's tools to think about how, like for example, in 19th century art, symbolism, how women like were always an allegorical vehicle to talk about the feminine evil, feminine evil being sexuality, being disease. Um, and now, you know, people, scholars who care about this stuff actually have the bandwidth and the, and the space, their, their work is getting attention. So we're building on one side, uh, you know, the present while we're also 
um, taking apart the past. And I think that's also really important. And interrogating representations. I mean, like the incredible show that was at the Columbia that Denise Murrell did about the black model. Um, you know, these are all things that were unthinkable or were in a time, you know, it went to the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, which is like the, the capital, the heart of all these paradigms that we're talking about, um, of male privilege and, and objectification and stuff. So I think it's, it's like a very interesting that we're doing it in bo at both speeds and at, in multiple layers. That's a really good point. And the, the, the great thing about it all is it's not a stretch to find the artist making the work, you know? That was a great last question. Thank you so much. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, it was really wonderful. Thanks for having us. Thank you, us. Allison. Thank you guys, too. <laughs>